Hi, I'm Marjorie Gwenya. I am a coach, author, and non-executive director. I hope you enjoy listening to these podcasts, and I encourage you to follow the InsureTech Business Series for very interesting and up-to-date industry information. Welcome to the InsureTech Business Series podcast. I am Fudimi. And I am Gamola. And together, we host the most exciting podcast on insurance and insurtech related topics in Africa. Stay tuned. Welcome, Marjorie. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Great, great. Uh, so how are you? How How is everything? Before we go into the serious bit of, you know, insurance people, I was joking about this in our last conversation that we insurance people would like to be uh, serious most <laughs> of the time, you know, about like, how are you? How have you been? How has uh, the pandemic affected you, you know, and things like that? I'm very well, thank you. I'm fortunate to not have suffered any health challenges during this pandemic. I I've had family and friends go through some difficult times, but uh, fortunately, many of them have made it through. So I'm in a good space. Great, great, great. Uh, so can you maybe tell us a bit about uh, yourself, like what you do, what uh, your day-to-day life is in terms of your profession and, and you know, help us get an understanding of what uh Marjorie is good at. I mean, I've, I've read uh, uh, some of your posts again. Like I said, I've been following you and you've done a lot of things. <laughs> All right, so. Yes, I have. So I'm a non-executive director for insurance companies in South Africa and Nigeria. I'm an actuary by training and I'm also a leadership and life purpose coach. I write and publish and I'm a speaker as well. So my days look very, very different uh, in any given week. I quite like the variety and the flexibility that I have with my work. I'm an explorer at heart. So I've lived in a number of countries, worked in a number of countries around the world and currently reside in South Africa, although I'm actually recording this podcast from Canada presently. I love languages and cultures and learning about new environments and I'm in the process of learning my fifth language, which is Spanish. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> I've been I've been beating myself up and saying I wanted to learn French and kind of like just been eluding me. Maybe me just <laughs> procrastinating, but uh, wow, fifth. <laughs> Interesting. Absolutely. So I, I really enjoy uh, interacting with language. It was something that I've been good at for most of my life, I guess. I started learning French at school. I was raised speaking uh, Shona, the language in Zimbabwe, and I picked up Dutch and Spanish as well uh, in my travels and adventures. Wow. Wow. <laughs> that, that really has to be very good. I mean, um, the fifth language, um, that's that's really good. That's impressive. Um, for those of us like Damola as well, who are looking to start learning French and possibly Swahili um, at any point in time. So, okay. I know that you mentioned that you've traveled a lot um, and um, it's safe to call you an explorer. And, you know, having seen your entire, you know, um, you know business management, um, sh- should I say pattern, I've seen that you've worked in various organizations at different um, um, places and environments. So having had all of these work experiences and um, worked in different business environments, what would you say um, about the insurance emerging markets like Nigeria? Our penetration rates, I like to talk about that, is... Um, still at zero point three percent, which is a far cry from where we want to be, like other um, places in Africa or on the continent generally. South Africa, for instance, has to be one of the best, and then we have um, Kenya and the likes of that. So, what do you think we can do better to ensure that um, we are able to cater to this emerging market and grow our insurance industry? So it's a great question. As I've observed the rest of the African continent, I would say South Africa has one of the highest penetration levels, if not the highest on the continent, and followed by places like uh, Mauritius or Zimbabwe that have reasonably high rates as well. The rest of the continent is fairly underserved 
And so I don't think that Nigeria is alone in that. Although given Nigeria's population, I suppose there's a lot of potential to grow the industry. For low income customers, I believe that there's a need for financial education. So really explaining the value of insurance and what it can offer. Also making these products more accessible and understandable to customers as they are going through circumstances that are perhaps different from the people that design these products. And certainly for all customer sets, there is the scope to distribute digitally as our lives and transactions become increasingly virtual. Now, this is an emerging area which has not quite matured. And in my view, there is value in having a, a comprehensive set of financial services that are offered by a single company for middle to high income customer bases. So, for example, in, in my case, being able to buy health, life and non-life insurance from one provider means that I am probably inclined to buy all of those products from them because they can have a consolidated view of my risk profile and my needs, and it makes it easy for me to transact in one place. So those are just some thoughts uh, in terms of what we could be doing. Yes, I, I hear you as regards financial education. And just to, to speak a bit about uh, how do we better serve this um, emerging market, uh, we've seen a lot of of solutions and, and a lot of talk about what we should be doing um, in terms of you know, micro insurance. And um, I, it's interesting that you, you mentioned there as regards... Uh, Kind of like the people who are designing these products should be able to relate to the realities of the people who need these products, uh, right? I mean, all the conversation about inclusion and things like that. I mean, uh, so we've been having some conversations uh, with uh, insurtechs and, and micro insurance companies as regards designing products uh, for the emerging market and design, maybe even designing products for women, for example. Mm -hmm. And people who are designing these things are not are not women; they're men. So how can you relate to some of these things? I mean, insurance was not something that emanated from, from, from this continent. It was quite a, adopted, right? And it seems like th this kind of creating, uh, you know, innovative products from the scratch seems uh, uh, important. Is, it, is this something that you, you agree with or you have any different um, approach that you think that we should go about uh, creating these bespoke products or products that actually solve the problems that people have? Absolutely. I, I support that view. I think that I would love to see a world where we completely rebase insurance and say, how do we design from scratch something that is suitable for an African customer, in particular, a customer that lives in a rural setting that is probably not going to need life insurance in the way that we might in a more urban setting. Mm. So what are the designs that are meaningful for their life circumstances, for the risks that they actually face, which are more than likely going to be about food protection and mm. about education needs than they are going to be about asset protection. So the field of microinsurance is certainly breaking ground uh, in that regard. And we see some interesting innovations from companies on the continent and elsewhere. And I would love to see more of those products um, proliferate across countries like Nigeria. Thank you for that, honestly. Um, and then I think that is actually very important. Um, one of the things that we talked about um, during our anniversary event was the fact that a lot of um, Africans need to start looking at, we need to start looking inward and not just at jobs, you know, policies from um, the Western world. For instance, um, um, a lady called um, Eunice, who had been on our podcast, mentioned that it was important to do, um, you know, products like truth contribution, for instance. And it was the same thing that we all mentioned um, during our um, webinar, talking about Isusu, for instance, where Nigerians can actually, or Africans can actually relate to um, that product. But one of the things we've always had issues with um, has always been data, especially data as it relates to pricing of most of our policies. 
um, majority of the data okay. sets that we get or that we use rather are being adopted from the UK um, in terms of a new T product. I'm talking about majority of the life market for instance, even for a um, motor insurance, um, as, as you know, um, easy as that seems, all of the data sets comes from the UK. So being an actuary, as well as a risk manager. Um, and I know that you've worked in that capacity of you know, several organizations. How do you think that these insurance companies and insure tech companies um, in Nigeria or across Africa can actually address those challenges of you know, data analysis and adequate pricing um, and rating of this um, you know, emerging product and services that we're looking to create for the underserved? That's a great question and a very pertinent one for this industry we're in that is highly data reliant. And what's interesting here is that the challenge that you describe is not unique to any one player. It's not the issue of any one company. So to gather the data that's going to be required to price products using local information will require a long-term collaboration of the industry players and indeed other bodies. So, for example, the local actuarial association, insurance Mm -hmm. associations and potentially regulators. So if I take the UK as an example, there is a dedicated institution that performs this function on behalf of the industry, and it's supported by the actual profession and some consultants. It's a full-time functioning body, and that works solely to ensure that there is a rolling source of data available for use by the industry. And we know that the reliability of data is only as good as its quality and its integrity And that is a significant part of the work that they do. Mm. So should Nigeria want to go in this direction, and I believe there was talk of doing so uh, not that long ago, then there are certainly examples which could serve as learning points across the world. You talked on something I'm quite keen on. I mean, like you said, the industry is quite data uh, heavy. Uh, So... uh, in terms of those examples, uh, I mean, you mentioned the UK. Are there other, maybe on the African continent, that you think that we could uh, learn from or adopt or new ways that you think that uh, some of these data are made available or harnessed or assessed that we can really look at, uh, at things? And maybe from your experience, you know, uh, leading in some of these companies or, or having conversation with, with people in these spaces. So interestingly, I've not come across many initiatives of this nature on the continent. The one that comes to mind is an example in Kenya, where there was an initiative to gather um, mortality data from across various sources and amalgamate those and to try and establish a database of sorts that um, insurance companies could use. So Unfortunately, not uh, to my knowledge anyway, although I, as I mentioned, I was aware that a number of countries had been considering this, including Nigeria, and I believe the other was Ghana as well. Mm, Okay. Uh, So... uh Again, looking at the, the, the fact that you, you've, you've been engaged in uh, different uh, companies and in different countries, and apart from the fact that languages are different, yes, but then uh, when you're looking at even the insurance industry, uh, even though, yes, insurance is 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 the same everywhere in the world, but then uh, in each of these countries, uh, when it comes to like the, the regulatory landscape, they're quite different. What can you say as regards what uh, maybe the regulator, you know, uh, should be doing uh, in terms of creating that enabling environment for innovation, for technology to come into the space? Uh, Because uh, it seems like that's uh, a way that we can really use to, to improve the level of penetration, you know, on the African continent. I mean... The African Continental Free Trade Agreement is here. How how are we taking advantage of that? Regulator, regulation definitely plays a huge role in how investments will come in and how do we attract uh, the people that we need to attract that come and you know set up in mm-hmm. our countries and things like that. So yes, certainly I think that uh, regulators have a huge role to play within this industry in allowing us to experiment and without being too penal about how that happens. There are a number of countries where they have these uh, concepts called uh, regulatory play boxes, where people can propose new ideas and experiment a little bit without it being uh, formally governed, so to speak, 
And the results of those uh, exercises inform the regulator in terms of how they can monitor and oversee uh, future developments in that domain. So I really think that regulators can help to not stifle innovation by being more flexible about new ideas which are beneficial to the work that the industry is trying to do. Um, Okay, one of the conversations we've always had, especially as it relates to regulation, is, um, like you mentioned, um, in terms of stifling innovation, um, especially in an era where we are looking to digitize most of our processes as well as, you know, create affordable or um, more flexible products that can be afforded by a majority of the populace. But I know that you are the um, one of the non-executive directors of um, Tangerine Life, and you're also the chair of the ERM committee of Tangerine Life. And um, one of the strategy for the company is to, you know, be the best digitally inclined organization in Nigeria, uh, well, across Africa as well. Um, what do you think that the organization could do amidst this um, regulatory challenge? Um, in a bid to attract, you know, digitally inclined markets in Nigeria. So there are a lot of insurtech startups that, um, I mean, judging by the fact that we've had most of these conversations that have been trying as much as possible to um, partner with incumbents, um, majority of them are actively always, um, they're always asking rather for Axel Mansat. So how do you think that Tangerine could further position themselves as the most, you know, digitally inclined organization for a market like this? I think that the Tangerine promise is quite compelling. So we're looking to become a comprehensive financial services player in Nigeria where customers can indeed have their financial needs met in one place, as I was referring to before. So where customers can be accessed both through their brokers and digitally. And with the recent acquisition of ARM Life, we're now a formidable company with further growth to achieve. I have no doubt personally that we're creating some interesting competition for the other major players in the market. Mm. Yeah, that's 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 interesting because I, I mean I, I see a lot of uh, of push and 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 quite interesting conversations as regards what is possible. And uh, funny enough, earlier on, you know, when we started off uh, last year, the podcast, uh, we had the uh, chief information officer Samuel Umbonu, uh, and he talked a bit about um, you know leveraging technology and and what what that would mean for for Tangerine Life. And so yeah, that that's that's quite Quite interesting, and I mean, what what I I would just want to ask is, yes, creating that uh, interesting competition, right? Uh, but in terms of actually, you know, impacting the market, right? Uh, what what what's that going to be like for for Tangerine Life? I mean, I know that there are a lot of other. Um, number of other um, investments that have been done in pensions and and you know I think again maybe what you said earlier as so regards having that one stop shop is 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 really just coming together there. So the impact is essentially giving customers access to a different offering from what they've been accustomed to. It's giving them a, a digital platform where they can interact which I'm aware others are attempting to do similarly, but will be the primary uh, focus and approach uh, within Tangerine's strategy over coming years. And as I mentioned, it's that ability to be able to come to one reliable place to get your needs met in different spheres. So whether that's uh, Tangerine money, Mm. or Tangerine life, Tangerine general, all the various aspects that we're able Mm. to offer I think is an attractive proposition for a client. Mm, that's, that, so that's interesting. So that's from the customer perspective. So now from the uh, employee perspective now, I mean, what, what's, uh, I know that, I mean, I'm, I'm asking this uh, uh, because I know that, I mean, you're a coach, you, uh, leadership coach, and mm. what would, uh, you know, maybe not necessarily with Tangerine Life, but then uh, what does the future of work in the insurance space look like for you? What 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 are the things that you're seeing? What are the conversations that you're having? Uh, what should we be preparing for when looking at the, the future of work? What's that picture uh, on the African continent specifically? Mm. The future of work for me is, is changing even as we speak. We couldn't have envisaged a year ago, two years ago, perhaps, 
that we would be working in the way that we are and and having done so for so long now find it quite Mm. ordinary to be operating virtually. So many companies were taken by surprise and proved their ability to be able to innovate quickly and to become platformed uh, as far as work goes. So I think the future of work involves a degree of adaptability. I suspect that we're not going to completely Mm. go back to the way things were before, and we're going to adopt hybrid models of working from home as well as interacting in the office and outside the office. I think that the excitement for me would come from working with companies that are looking to innovate and disrupt the industry, companies that are looking to leverage emerging technologies, Mm. companies that are alive to emerging trends on the continent and locally, and that are looking to serve real customer needs. And that requires a constant ability to reinvent oneself, to learn, to stay relevant by upskilling not just the people, but the firm's capabilities as well. So the world of work is exciting, uh, probably less stagnant than it might have been for people entering the industry even 10 years ago. Okay, okay. Um, Really, that's, I think that's one of the things that um, a lot of us should be looking out for. And I know that um, you've acquired a lot of um, certifications as well as, you know, a lot of knowledge. And now that you mentioned um, this particular work style, what kind of soft skills do you think that a lot of us um, need to acquire, especially as it comes to working in a digitalized era? So I think that today's generation of uh, workers need to be thinking in terms of having more than one career. Our world is changing so rapidly that people are not going to be stuck in one job for their entire uh, working lifetimes. At least that's my sense. That as things change, so do we have to change. So the core skill that I believe people are going to need is adaptability. People will also need to be good at networking and communicating in today's increasingly connected world. It's so easy to be in touch with people. It's so easy to share information, to offer information, to stay up to date. And therefore, that desire and curiosity to learn will be very important. We live in an age where access to education is much easier than it ever was. And indeed, with access to even free courses that are offered online, this is something that I would encourage uh, workers and uh, youth people participating in this industry to be up to speed with. Mm, mm, yeah, th- that's, that's, that's interesting. Uh, I mean, there's, there's, there's been this thing that has been on my mind. Uh, I've always, there's always been a question and I always try to ask to get, to learn from people, especially who people like you, who, I mean, coach others about it and and others who have done some credible work in the past you know because of experience and things like that uh where do you i mean draw the line in taps in terms of uh pursuing your passion uh i know i used to watch this program on on cnn you know passion to portfolio and they talk about people who you know have this passion about doing this and that and then it becomes a proper business right uh that's probably one story out mm. of maybe a hundred, a thousand, you know, out there. Uh, but then how do you, as an individual, as a professional, you know, draw the line? So you're not drawn into that whole, you know, uh, sunk cost fallacy uh, that is, is actually a problem mm. because you just... And I think that uh, even the insurance industry generally, uh, that's something that uh, we probably suffer from. Uh, but then what, what? when is the right time to make that change, um, change your direction or, or just stop? So I think it's a lucky few that start out their careers in the areas that they're passionate about and it's great for them. But I think the majority find themselves mm. in a situation where they're doing work because it pays the bills or they're doing work as a means to an end. Perhaps they Mm. want to save up money to one day do the thing that they love. So the right time is different for everyone. Perhaps the question to ask oneself is, what is it that I'm waiting for? At Mm. what point are you going to decide 
that you want to do something you're passionate about. Now, doing something that you enjoy and, and that has meaning for you does not have to be your day job. So a lot of people end up volunteering. And certainly that's how I initially started to indulge my passions for personal development. I was a long-term volunteer and continue to be a volunteer for my profession. And eventually I left my corporate role to serve my profession as president because that was something that was meaningful to me. I am now working on a business that is aligned with my passions. And it took courage in order to do that. Mm. It took challenging my own assumptions about what success looked like. It took questioning the reasons that I kept giving myself for not making that leap. And, and it's interesting for me to talk to people now who are thinking about it, but haven't yet done so. And many of their arguments center around, but how can I give up the lifestyle that I'm currently leading? Well, the truth is it's a trade-off, isn't it? It's a choice that you have to make. Do you want to be captive to your lifestyle or do you want to enjoy yourself? Which ones are going to be? And hopefully you can have both. Yes but that's going to require some concerted effort in terms of restructuring life. So people will always find reasons not to change what they're doing because it's scary. It's really frightening to leap into the unknown, especially if you have financial commitments that are covered by your job and that job happens to not be your passion. Okay. Um, I, I do agree with you. Um, this is like 101% of course, um, because again, like, you know, the saying goes that it's, I think it's one of the scariest things to do to have been used to something and then suddenly you probably have to change your trajectory. But I know that you coach yes. people and um, you are very good at what you do. But sometimes when, um, you know, say when life gives you lemons, you just make lemonade. Um, how do you stay pumped up or jet up or motivated, you know, to keep to keep it ongoing? I mean, to keep coaching people who, how do you find, you know, um, how do you connect to your source to be able to manage, um, you know, or lead people. Mm -hmm. Who coaches Marjorie in summary? <laughs> <laughs> so that's a great question. I actually have several coaches who work with me on different aspects of my personal development. I have one that specifically helps me growing my coaching business and others who help me with other more personal or spiritual matters. I also have a range of mentors that I connect with from time to time. And this really is quite an informal arrangement. These are people that I look up to, whose advice I value, whose experience for me is remarkable. And they are kind enough to give me their time to be able to lean on them when I need advice. When I'm dealing with challenges, I'm someone that tends to go internally. So I introspect quite a lot. I like to take quiet time. And I use that time to do some meditating and reflecting. And the ultimate goal for me is to let go of my negative emotions. So whatever it is that I'm experiencing, I recognize that life happens in seasons. And so if something is not working at a given time, I know that it's not a permanent state. So I allow myself to feel the feelings and then to be able to release them, knowing that whatever will come in the next chapter will be better. And I can learn from it. I also lean on my close family and friends for support. So if I'm going through something, chances are I'm talking to two or three people who have different perspectives and can offer me angles that I wouldn't otherwise see for myself. Mm, mm. I, I definitely am I'm a huge fan of, of listening to people who I look up to, you know, speaking to them, asking questions. I, I, I'm a huge fan of quotes as well, you know, just to keep myself pumped and, and encourage myself, you know, uh, when things are not going the way that I want it, you know, just to see, okay, how, how this, this person has been through a similar path. How did this person go through it? You know, and maybe I don't even have close um, connection with that person, but just reading about their story, you know, and, and hearing them speak, you know, could really just encourage me. Uh, and so, I mean, listening to responses there, and I see that there's this thing about, you know, relationships and connections with other people. Uh, is that something that as young professionals, myself included, uh, 
is that something that we shouldn't uh, relegate or or think that is not important you know especially looking at the fact that we are going uh, virtual now you know so that in person meetings and uh, you know in the office or at at uh, conferences are reduced now uh, you know having those relationships how important is it you know uh, for you know a young professional trying to grow in this space i would say relationships are vital non negotiable in fact wow. <laughs> you're not going to thrive in this industry or any industry so to speak if you're not connected somehow if you don't understand people if you're not seeking alternative perspectives to your own if you're not plugged into what's happening and staying in touch and it's interesting for me how relationships have played a very strong role in how my career has developed a number of my opportunities have come to the fore because of network connections because somebody made a suggestion or connected me to somebody to talk to about an opportunity or an angle and those instances have just been serendipitous and invaluable so i couldn't emphasize enough the importance of relationship building thank you very much majri um, i'm sure that this has been very exciting and interesting for for us as well as um, you know our listeners who would obviously get to listen to this but then again um, before we let you go would like to always um, allow you to you know give your certain details of how people can contact you and reach out to you especially with the fact that you're a coach um and um part of leadership as well as you know um some other parts of the business so how how do people contact you and how do they reach out to you how do we get coaching lessons from you <laughs> the best way to contact me is probably via my website which is aboutmarjorie.com or to reach out to me on linkedin i'm listed as marjorie gwenya if somebody would like to drop me an email it's quite a simple address it's marj.coach at gmail.com so m a r j dot coach at gmail dot com. It's been an interesting conversation, and I've learned a lot. I I definitely ho- hope that I can get a a coaching session because uh, if I can learn from the best, then I'll be the best. <laughs> so yeah, but yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's been wonderful. Hi, and I hope you did enjoy that conversation. Quite interesting one. Do ensure that you continue to listen to our podcast and share as well with your colleagues and friends uh, future episodes and even previous ones on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, on every platform that you get your podcasts. Right, and also don't forget to join the conversation on all of our social media platforms. You might have comments, reviews, as well as questions. Please do share on our LinkedIn page, on our Twitter page, as well as remember to follow us.